Welcome. I'm David Levi Strauss, Chair of the MFA Program in Art Writing here at the School of Visual Arts. Tonight we're pleased to have Cynthia Cruz join us to read from and talk about her new book of essays, Disquieting Essays on Silence. Or is it Disquieting Essays on Silence? <laughs> Cindy graduated from this program in 2015. We've now had a number of graduates who have published books after graduating that drew directly or indirectly from the work they did here. Cindy's thesis focused on the work of four women writers, Marguerite Duras, uh, Clarice Lispector, Ingeborg Bachmann, and artist Hanna Darboven. Uh, the thesis was titled Keine Neue Welt ohne Neue Sprache no new world without a new language. Cindy's the author of five collections of poems. Most recent is Dregs from Four-Way Books. She's the editor of a new anthology of contemporary Latina poetry called Other Musics, forthcoming this year, and is the recipient of fellowships from Yaddo, the McDowell Colony, and a Hodder Fellowship from Princeton University. Please welcome Cynthia Cruz. Thank you. I really love being called Cindy because that's my real name. <laughs> it is. Um, so what I have for you is um, there's six, I think there's six chapters in the new book that will be out at the end of the month. And um, this, what I'm going to be showing you is an excerpted excerpt sort of. So um, during the Q&A, you can ask me questions about um, holes in what I presented because there probably will be. Um, but I wanted to focus on film because it's SVA, and I thought that made sense. Um, but I want to say, too, that um, Levi's completely right, that the origin of this book um, began here when I worked on my thesis, and I started thinking about um, how silence is a language and um, how the language of silence can work as a form of resistance. And so I did my thesis here, and I continued on at Rutgers and worked um, actually on the same thing. And so the collection of essays did begin here. And um, yeah, so I'm going to be reading for a while, about 28 minutes. So I'll be showing you some, some images. Um, and then I want to hear whatever questions you have. So does this light work? <laughs> it does. So this chapter is called The Afterlife of Trauma. And this is the quote here by John Acomfra. He is a filmmaker, curator, and an artist. Um, everyone who helped to popularize the philosophy of montage was interested in one thing, the third meaning. That somehow when things collide, two opposites collide in this dialectical way, some sort of synthesis is engineered or brought about, and in that a new form, a new meaning, or a new way emerges. You can all hear me? Yeah. Over the years, I've become more and more attuned to the gesture. In particular, I'm interested in the way in which the anorexic and the depressed or melancholic body can be read as an act of gesture. Her body performs what she is unable to speak. Lars von Trier's film, Melancholia, can be read as a film constructed of such gestures. Justine, the protagonist, descends into melancholia and escapes from her own wedding to hide out in her sister's study. There, finally alone, she searches frantically through the monographs of various artists, rifling through pages until she comes upon an image that suits her. She places the book back on the display shelf where she found it, open to the image, and continues searching for more, only after she's found and displayed a number of images that match her internal state, does she abandon the room, leaving the images to be discovered?
Among those she's chosen to display are Peter Bruegel's The Elders, The Land of Cocaine, and The Hunters in the Snow. This is The Hunters in the Snow. In The Hunters in the Snow, three hunters stand at the edge of a precipice with dogs. All appear depleted, exhausted. It would not be a stretch to say they seem to be trudging back home. In a scene that occurs later in the film, Melancholia, Justine uses just this word, trudging, to describe her experience of melancholia. In the land of cocaine, three figures lie on their backs on the earth, apparently sated from food and drink. It's interesting to me that the figures are lying on their backs on the ground as if they are ill or near death. Certainly in this position, they have lost agency. The image shows the afterlife of gluttony and excess. Bruegel's painting of the hunters parallels Justine and her sister's forays outdoors with their horses earlier in the film, while at the same time illuminating the extreme lethargy Justine experiences as melancholia enters her body. Throughout the film, Justine has both embodied depression's various symptoms, lethargy, extreme sorrow, dissociation, and attempted to describe to her sister in painstaking precision and to no avail, her experience of depression's onslaught. Unable to make herself understood through words, Justine has been reduced to the act of gesture, leaving the images for people to find. Lacan's theory of trauma offers some insight into Justine's actions. Trauma occurs, he asserts, when there is an encounter with what he calls the real, that which defies signification. He writes that encounters with the real or experiences with trauma where the link between two thoughts have succumbed to repression and must be restored. In the study scene in Melancholia, Justine attempts to find a language for her trauma through the use of image. Image becomes the link between the thoughts. In Alexander Kluge's film, Abschied von Gestern, the female protagonist, Anita G, is Jewish and from Eastern Europe. Her family was sent to the camps and she lost everything during the war. The film traces her attempts to assimilate into the new post-war West Germany, but she is unable to do so. Near the start of the film, Anita G appears in court where she has been summoned for having stolen a cardigan. When the judge asks why she stole the cardigan, Anita G answers, it just came over me. Her response articulates only the fact that her body took hold of her, or rather that her unconscious did. Though her rational mind knows assimilation and behaving according to the mores of West German society are necessary for her survival, her unconscious, in collaboration with her body, resists. In her response to the judge, Anita G. does not offer a viable explanation or provide any context for her action. Although admitting her guilt and explaining why she stole the cardigan would allow her to appear more conciliatory and capable of rehabilitation, she refuses to do so. Her ambivalence, her desire both to assimilate and not to assimilate, makes her appear irrational, idiotic to the court and to the West German culture. Describing her, Alexander Kluge says, Anita G. was born in a Jewish family that left in the 30s and she got her socialization with the experience that there is a form of society that will suppress and kill your family and eventually yourself." End quote. Thus Anita G. recognizes both the need to assimilate into German culture to survive and the real threat that assimilating into German culture poses. Anita G.'s ambivalence demonstrates the impossible choice she must make. The only true means of survival is assimilation, and yet, for her, assimilation entails swallowing the culture's denial of her past and, with it, its denial of who she is in the present. A Jewish subject whose history informs her day-to-day -day life and the culture at large. This choice, this inability to choose, ensures Anita G's self-annihilation. Caught between assimilating and not assimilating and having made the decision not to provide a viable explanation for her theft, Anita G. renders herself irrational in the eyes of the judge. Even if she were to provide her context, she would nonetheless remain indecipherable. Because the cultural and political history she shares with those around her has been removed from their lives, Anita G., who is formed by this history and carries it in her body, as her body, appears incomprehensible. When those she comes in contact with hear her words, words that require historical context to fully comprehend, they think those words nonsensical and she, as a result, appears irrational. <clears throat> 
The film opens with a quotation rendered on a blank screen. Uh, we are separated from yesterday, not by an abyss, but by the change situation. No attribution is provided. This presentation allows Kluge to present the text as disembodied. By providing this text at the onset of the film without identifying its author, Kluge removes it from the body of its author. And by opening the film in this way, he offers us a means by which to read the film. The changed situation, when seen as the historical backdrop of Germany, explains the space between, the gulf that separates Anita G. from other Germans throughout the film. When she presents herself as a body carrying this experience, those she encounters render her invisible. She becomes what Mark Fisher describes as the weird. She does not, cannot fit in. As a result of this willfully made culture blind spot to recent history, Anita G's experience remains, remains invisible to those around her. And I'm going to show you the opening of the film. <laughs> Hat er von der Mutter die Tochter getrennt? Hat er von der Tochter die Mutter getrennt? Hat er einen Gefangenen nicht freigelassen? Einen Gefangenen nicht gelöst? Hat er einen Eingekerkerten das Licht nicht schauen lassen? Hat er bei einem Gefangenen fange ihn gesagt? These floating words and the disembodiments that occur throughout the film are addressed when, in a number of scenes where she, she appears alone, Anita G stuffs tiny bits of food into her mouth. It is as if in this re repeated act she attempts to simulate her own assimilation into the culture by breaking food into small digestible pieces and swallowing them. To assimilate, she must break herself into small digestible bits. Her binging might also be an attempt at inversely consuming the culture she cannot bear to eat. Here the somatic comes into play. Though Anita G is rendered powerless by her place in the culture, she can, for small moments, regain increments of power by determining how and what she consumes. Anita G's language is informed by her own experience of loss and trauma directly connected to Germany's history. At the same time, the judge seemingly speaks of his own personal experience, of the law texts he regularly consults during the court scene. For example, when the judge asks her, why did you give all that up, referring to her job in the East, Anita G responds, I got scared and moved to the West. He then asks, because of certain incidents? She responds, because of prior incidents. The discrepancy between the judge's reality and Anita G's is exemplified by the judge's use of certain, a word that remains vague and could pertain to almost anything, and her use of the word prior, which refers to a specific event, the Holocaust. After Anita G corrects the judge, he says, you mean those from 1943 to 1944? I don't believe that. In my experience, they don't affect young people. In response, Anita G states, I felt unsafe. She and the judge speak the same German language and yet they also speak two very different languages. Anita G speaks from her body informed by its history, a history those she, those she encounters do not see or recognize. Meanwhile, the judge is unable to find the references she makes to history in its text. Similarly, he cannot locate them in his own personal experience. He is blind to the historical facts that directly form her life, or rather, he may be aware of them. He refers to, he refers to specific dates, after all. But these facts remain ostensibly separate from his day-to-day -day life and his own lived experience. They do not inform his understanding. Kluge unfolds, unfolds the discrepancy between Anita G's account and the judge's, and this is a quote. This federal republic in no way recognizes the situation in which it actually is, end quote. The historical facts thus remain at arm's length and are fragmented and removed from the body and the mind of the judge. The two characters' interactions with one another, the judge speaking from his personal experience as well as the rules of law, and Anita G speaking of her own experience and its relation to history, illuminate the power structure inherent in language and explain Anita G's repeated experience of being marginalized by those she encounters in West German culture. She remains enigmatic to those she comes in contact with, a problem without a cause, as Alexander Kluge explains in an interview with John Dawson. And this is a quote from that interview. I think someone who has concrete experience of our society's history 
and who comes into an, an ahistorical society that is pressured not to notice its past will have conflicts. And these conflicts can't be observed on the level of pure common sense or on the level on which institutions function. That's why the people around Anita G cannot understand why she behaves like a criminal or why she tries to become happy but doesn't succeed or why she gives up opportunities and tries to find chances where none exist. Why Anita G would wish to conform to her culture while at the same time engaging in acts that ensure her self-destruction within that culture becomes clear by looking squarely at the prospects of living in a society where only those who participate and perform productivity can survive. Here the labor performed is not only the work of earning money, but also the work of repressing the, fa the past. Anita G wishes to assimilate into the culture because she understands this is necessary. Due to history, she has no family, no networks, no education, no money. She must therefore find a form of work in order to continue to survive. Anita G is indeed a survivor. Though she may be seen as a failure by others in the culture, the fact that her body exists in the culture is in, its, in itself a form of resistance. Her physical presence serves as a kind of living archive. To find work, she must assimilate into the culture, and yet she cannot. Opting out is not an option either. To do so would only render her further mar marginalized both invisible to the culture due to its refusal to see the context from which her experience is formed and made further invisible by not participating in the shared post-war culture of production and easy consumption. And yet the desire to assimilate has indeed taken root inside Anita G as evidenced, for instance, by her purchase of a fur coat and her theft of the cardigan. While these forms of assimilation seem contradictory to her resistance, they are also a natural fact of living in a capitalist culture where, as Herber Herbert Marcuse writes, the desires of the culture are introjected into its citizens. The difference between our desires and the desires introjected into us can be difficult to distinguish, and the culturally introjected desires can be lived intensely inside the body. At the same time, there remains within Anita G an aspect of not wanting what her culture offers her. This not wanting is shaped by her understanding of her culture's denial of her past, which is, in essence, a denial of her existence. Water. So, I'm going to show you two clips from a film called The Woman, the Orphan, and the Tiger. I think I'm going to show you one clip and then talk to you about it a bit. After a while, you notice the residue. You can tell on the street what used to be. Sometimes it is the regular police and sometimes it is the riot police. Every day, the same barbed wire pricks its way across the sky. The same red lit cross of the Christian church's steeple makes the same kind of commentary behind the same uniformed men with rifles guarding the gates at the military base where you turn right to walk home. When you go to the movies, you take the shortcut behind Yongsan Station where the prostitutes apply makeup even while waiting on display in their red lit boxes, the same shade of red as the butcher's windows in another part of the city the same shade of red as the cross on the steeple. You wonder why, in lights, they seem to have only this one shade of red. Sex red, meat red, motel red, konglish red, Jesus died for your sins red, Korea at night red. Her our body filled with a foreign military, a barbed wire gash running through the body of her our nation, running through her our family, her our country now filled with another foreign military, was never supposed to know, was never supposed to know about occupations for that matter, was never supposed to. In the film The Woman, the Orphan and the Tiger from 2010, Jane Jen Kaysen 
Angustin Song Den Kong construct three portraits of women sufferers of trauma through the use of old footage, oral testimonies, poetry, public statements, and interviews, the filmmakers allow glimpses into fragments of three narratives of women from Korean society, chronicling the violence inflicted upon them, the former comfort women subjected to sex slavery by the Japanese military during, world, during the Second World War, the second, sex workers who worked around United States military bases in South Korea from the 1950s, and continue to work to the present, and the portrayal of transnational women adoptees sent as children from the South Korea, from South Korea mostly to the West during the Korean War. Each of the women's experiences, though individual, stands in for a collective of women whose general stories they share. The filmmaker's choice of presenting such a stylistic duality is interesting in relation to the chorus of voices in the film and the idea that each woman's experience stands alone and cannot be collapsed beneath a name or a label. On the one hand, there exists the idea that each of us is entirely different, unique. This view corresponds with the ideology of capitalism and more recently neoliberalism. On the other hand, there exists the idea of community, that each of us is merely one part of a larger community. This view corresponds to non-capitalist cultures and elements of this can still be found in immigrant communities in Western cultures and in non-Western cultures. By presenting and in fact conflating these two opposing ideologies, the filmmakers infer a myriad of troubling questions. Now that globalization has spread capitalism and or capitalist ideology, are there any spaces that remain free of capitalism's ideology? This idea is made manifest in a scene in the film where a, lead, a lit red plastic cross is shown, followed by a depiction of a strip of American style bars in which a number of US military servicemen and women are shown in civilian clothing. The area is presumably outside the military base and a site for local men and women to earn money through bartending and prostitution. The presence of the US military base permanently changes the culture of the place it occupies. If the base were to close, the local workers would lose their jobs. But what the base brought with it, gambling, prostitution, alcohol, Christianity, would remain. I'll show the other clip. Trying to figure out how I can talk about something that is unseen, that most people don't believe I in. Something really horrible. Been having that very the, the secret dream. itself, or the gap in one's speech, gives rise uh, to a ghost. Anyway, I my personal illness also is wrapped in my So I started to look at the whole food of our heads and ashes. I realized that somehow we are entangled in a way that it seems almost impossible to get out of it. What you can find by is not just what you're trying to do. It's very hard to get out of it. 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 They want to think of the adoptee as being the What if the part that matters is mute without the We call it so many of them are rushing to the At one time in the film, a female voice states, trying to figure out how I can talk about something that is unseen that most people don't believe, something really horrible that the secret itself or the gap in one's speech gives rise to a ghost. And there's a gap in that sentence. In the same scene, an elder woman collapses into the arms of a younger South Korean woman at what appears to be a tribunal. Presumably, the woman had been a comfort woman and has either already given testimony or was about to do so. Rather than including the woman's testimony to depict what has happened to her, the filmmakers chose instead to include the clip of her fainting. I watch as the woman's body drops into the arms of a younger woman at her side. The woman's falling is captured in slow motion, rendering the act richer, slowing it down, forcing me to remain longer with her in each moment as her fainting unfolds. Were her fall to have been recorded in regular time, the mind, my mind, might think, oh, she fainted, collapsing the experience into a mere category or label. 
in other words, flattening it. Capturing the act of the woman's feigning as the result of having to testify to speak about what happened to her body and her psyche archives her affective experience. Fainting in response to the setting, the tribunal, condenses her experience in much the same way a dream condenses experience. The woman's fainting, we don't learn her name or anything about her particular experience, making her a symbolic stand-in for the many other unnamed women like dream condensation, compresses what is repressed into a brief but rich series of metaphors and metonymies. In its current form, the unnamed Korean woman's fainting remains rich in its symbolism, representing myriad readings for myriad of survivors' experiences. In her essay, A Ghost in the House of Justice, Death and the Language of the Law, Shoshana Fellman intervenes in the reading of the Eichmann trials, arguing that the fainting of one of the witnesses Kezetnet, a concentration camp survivor, is a form of saying. She writes, quote, Kezetnet's legal muteness, his inability to tell the story in the trial, is part of the impossibility of telling at the trial's heart, unquote. She continues, but Kezetnet's testimony does not simply tell about the impossibility of telling. It dramatizes it, enacts it, through its own lapse into coma and its own collapse into a silence. That's the end of that quote. The inability to articulate evidence by losing consciousness it's, is itself a gap or rupture in language and, as such, conveys as much as the use of verbal language promises. Like the spaces and gaps in the material archives, the Korean elders' loss of consciousness also produces a space, a gap, or a rupture, a placeholder for what cannot be spoken. What remains and what is visible and present is an unconscious body, precisely what the gaps are meant to mark. The fainting scene in The Woman, the Orphan, and the Tiger opens with a single woman's voice speaking, but her voice is soon lost in a chorus of other women's voices. The choice to incorporate a range of female voices, one, of two, one or two of which are comprehensible at the start but slowly become lost in the mix of voices, tells something else. That there are many voices of many women and each woman has a different experience. At the same time, the sound collage suggests that the women's voices and lives and experiences are also intricately connected to one another's as the stories they tell. The distinct and overlapping forces and forms of violence are not neatly separable or named. This complexity calls for new methods of transcribing and archiving. Finally, the rupturing here of voices or voices also performs the fragmentation that is a result of trauma. The gestures we have spoken of here, Justine's selection of images of melancholia, Anita G's use of food in Abschied von Gestern, the woman's fainting in the woman, the orphan and the tiger, Kezat and its fainting during the Eichmann trial, are all enactments of an alternative language, one that arises when speech fails. And these acts are not unlike the way the body of the anorexic or the depressive or melancholic performs what cannot be said. These are some of the ways we can speak without using speech, traces of what John Acomfra describes as a new way. And yet Acomfra's new way becomes possible through a dialectic, through the act of moving back and forth between. What then might, be, what then might this dialectic be? One possibility is to look at the anorexic or others, depressives, melancholics, drug addicts, other people who resist by withdrawing. They resist assimilation, but at the same time, they do not give in. As Mark, Mark Fisher writes in Ghosts of My Life, Writings on Depression, Hauntology, and Lost Futures, he writes, the kind of melancholia that I'm talking about consists not in giving up on desire, but in refusing to yield. It consists, that is to say, in a refusal to adjust to what current conditions call reality even if the cost of that refusal is that you feel like an outcast in your own time. In this way, then, the possibility of a new way, a third way, arises through the dialectic between assimilation and death, somewhere in the middle way, where the anorexic and the depressive and the melancholic and the others already exist. Thanks. So, um, that's a really great question. I had to think about it. So um, Melancholia, the film Melancholia, I've been um, obsessed with since it came out and I've seen it many times and I've written about it a bunch of times. Um, and so that was a film I kept trying to figure out why I kept going back to it. Um, and then I realized there's a bunch of reasons, but one of them is that um, the main character um, is 
is performing with her body. She's reduced to a gesture. So that um, that was that was whenever the movie came out. And then um, Abschied von Gestern was one of the chapters I was working on. I got a master's in uh, German language and literature, and so I was looking at four women um, who resist. And so she was one of the characters. And then. Wait, what's the other one? And then the other film I saw actually um, in Berlin when I was working on my um, project. And so I saw that film and I also um, was thinking, because it's, uh, it would, I, I guess I become very obsessed with things and I don't know why and I just keep looking and looking and looking and writing about them. And then I realize that they all have this similar um, theme. No, it's good. I mean, the thing that I started realizing, so this book, um, I started working on it here, and I came here in 2013. So it's been a lot of it's been a lot of work, and so I've been you know, and I've been um, revising and editing the essays. So I've been thinking about how right they could be folded into other things yeah. um, that I'm thinking about now that I wasn't thinking about so much then. So the hauntology or the idea of um, right, so Mark Fisher's idea. Sorry, I'm supposed to be repeating the question. <laughs> I just remember that. So the question of how. Um, this idea that Abschied von Gestern opening quote might be related to Mark Fisher's hauntology. Um, that's great. I mean, that's like a whole book. But um, this idea that she actually is in this liminal, that's what I think, she's in this liminal space that no longer exists. And, and so everyone else is in like the now, right? They're in the now, post-war Germany. But she ha she's walking around like with this body that has this history that's been um, removed from where she is. So that's... Yeah, I mean, just thank you, because I'll be writing that essay soon. <laughs> That's really great. Um, but right, it's, but I, the other thing I was thinking about is that she is um, like the working class citizen in America or like other people who are marginalized. And so their history is not represented by the people that they're surrounded by. So I think she's also just a great case for all of that stuff. And then the second one, um, What was the second question? Yeah, so it was just if you felt like that quote had any interactions with the German judge and the woman oh, right. who were speaking the same language but for different positions. Right, so the different languages of the two Germans speaking in the same language. I mean, the thing I was thinking about, actually, this isn't answering your question, is Paul Ceylon, right, who um, spoke in German and he was taught, I mean, he taught. His mother was speaking to him. Anyway, his German was his language, and he could have gone and used another language, but he continued to work in German and stayed there. Well, he went to Paris. But, um, but how do you write in a language that is um, filled with uh, the powers? I mean, that's exactly her situation, right? Um, and so he had to find a new language, and when he would give speeches, right? I mean, I'm sure you know this, but he would have to give speeches that uh, were sort of... Um, neutral, but at the same time they were addressing the very people who were sitting in the audience who were actually responsible for his family's death. So, um, so I think it relates a lot to that, the, di the same language but different language and, and the um, hierarchy or hegemony or whatever you want to call it, definitely for sure. And the whole idea of creating a new language, right, is what I was really thinking about when I was working on my project here and that it has to have some kind of um, silence in it, I think, to resist. Yeah, it's, I'm supposed to repeat what you just said, but you, you were talking about the, the um, way that I said the word certain was vague and then uh, previous is not vague. And then also that the three films, um, one is in English, but the other is in, or they're in other languages. So I wasn't thinking that much about, I mean, with the German I obviously was because I was studying German, um, but not so much, I guess. Um, in a way, I um, nearly showed the um, Abschied von Gestern without um, English subtitles because I, I felt like maybe it doesn't matter in a way. I mean, in a way, it kind of doesn't. But I didn't do that, of course. So anyway, but the first one, I think that's really great. And the thing I was thinking about with that, I hadn't thought of that, but that was odd. That certain is not actually vague. It's very specific. But it makes me think about, um, and this relates to melancholia, is the whole advert, the way that our culture now um, in, in the United States, we're very literal. So like even in my poetry workshops, students read things very literally, and they want things to be explained literally to them. Um, and I, 
I blame that on a bunch of things, but it's like this advertisement culture, right? And so I think in that way, um, words that are very specific that reduce things are actually, um, in a weird way, they're vague. They don't allow for the complexity, and so we have to think of other words that will allow for the complexity, if that makes sense. Yeah. In the land of cocaine, <laughs> I know I'm just, I'm, I have to like sum it up really quick. Um, the question of uh, why I said that they look like they have no agency, and the other question um, whether silence suggests agency or the obvious. So the whole book is about um, silence um, and agency, and, and that, that contradiction, right? Because silence in our culture actually means having no agency, right? And people who are silenced are silenced, and then, um, and then you have no agency. So what was very interesting to me, I looked at the um, master's project I did here and then in the German department, and I, I realized it's the same thing, which was the question of um, if you have no agency, how do you get agency? And you can assimilate. I guess you can take a lot of um, drugs or whatever and then not be silenced. I don't know. I'm just... Um, or you can or you can disappear, right? And so what I was interested in is this middle ground, right? So not self-destruction and escaping the culture, but not assimilating whatever that would look like either. So the second question is what the whole book is really about, is exploring ways of agency for people who are silenced. And the first one, um, I mean, literally, they're laying on their back. So I thought they don't have any agency, and they look like they can't get up. And then I thought that was so interesting, right, of course, because she's moving around, at least in the first part of the film, but, um, and she's very productive, right? She's the perfect neoliberal um, case, but she has no agency at all. And um, her story, right, is that she's assimilated and then she just can't take it anymore. And in a way, she's like those men. She's so full and sated with this culture, but she can't, like, she can't do it anymore. And then she literally breaks down. Yeah, so again, that's, um, so the question is how silence can be resistance. Um, so again, that's the, the whole book talks about that. I'll try to think of, um, mm, So the other thing I forgot to mention, it's not in here, is that I'm also very interested in failure and sort of the idea of the loser as um, a form of resistance. And so um, withdrawing from the culture um, instead of assimilating, I think, is a form of resistance. And I'm not the first person to come up with that. Jack Halberstam wrote an entire book on that. Um, but this idea of, um, right again, not assimilating but not self-destructing, and if you're marginalized, why not just pull back even more, and in that way you can make your own space. And so it's, it's a sort of like condensed, the idea. And the, the question too is that why is silence considered um, weak? Somebody recently, um, I heard someone use the term broken about a person who was um, very quiet, and it really bothered me, and I thought, why, like, what does that word broken mean? And then furthermore, why is broken bad? Like, that's another, it's like one of these words, right? Because I, when people, I know people who are quiet and um, they think a lot and um, they're concerned with the world, those are not the people I consider, uh, it's weird, right? Because they're, they're weak in a way because they're not participating in these other things, but they have their own agency in a different way. No, that's really great. And I was when I um, I got very mad, and um, when I heard somebody call somebody broken, and um, and my husband suggested I do a blog, which I refused to do. But I, I wrote this thing, and I kept revising this thing, and um, and then I got to the point where I thought, why am I so mad, right? And I get mad because people um, use certain words to put people in their place to reduce them into these, um, they fix them in these places um, of oppression. But then the other thing, right, is then to take that stuff, like the, the term the loser or the failure or the quiet person and have that not be a bad thing, but it's still, it's tricky because we're still um, fixed into our place. You know, when I go out in the world and people interpolate me when they um, see me as something and that's what I am, which happens all the time, that, that's true, that does happen. I mean, that happens to all of us, right? So it's, it's like this, and that's why I'm so interested in the dialectic, because it's, it's not this, but it's not that, it's somewhere in between. Yeah, no, I know the Atlas Project, I think it's amazing, and a lot of the, actually what I cut out of this was um, 
my discussion about the archive and the use of archival work because I think that that um, is another way and that's what a conference talking about actually is um, if you use um, like with that project all the different pieces then you can really get the complexity and it fights against this reductive I mean for me it's really important I guess my um, it's really important that nothing be reduced to one thing it's really important because I've seen that happens over and over right that nobody is one thing um, and that's why um, the film the woman the orphan and the tiger is so powerful to me because she's dealing with that the fact that there's all these voices and they share something but not one person do you know in the same way that not all Americans are exactly the same or whatever and um, I'm very committed I guess to that idea that um, that we do share, but we're all very different, and each of us has a different story. Any other questions, comments, insults? <laughs> do you have one? <laughs> so the book will be out by the end of the month, and it's being published by Book Thug from Canada. And it's, um, if you go to the website, also McNally Jackson has it on their website. That's it. Thank you. <laughs>